Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 29th edition of the Coffee Microcaps Morning Meeting. My name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps for anybody who's joining us this morning for the first time. For all our regulars, uh, welcome back to another edition. So compliance and disclaimer. Uh, for anybody who is joining us for the first time, um, the, we generally run these every fortnight, uh, although more recently we've been running them every week. Um, it's plus minus an hour where we've got two companies in to present. Each has a 30 minute slot, which is roughly broken down into a 20 minute presentation and then 10 minutes of Q&A at the end. If you do have any questions, uh, please type them in the Q&A box uh, in the navigation bar rather than the chat function. And uh, the Q&A uh, function just makes it easier to moderate the questions as we get to the end. And um, the webinar is being recorded, so please note that. And it will be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel. So if presenters um, runs over a particular slide a little bit too quickly, uh, you can watch the presentation back and it should be up um, 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. Uh, you can follow Coffee Microcaps at Twitter is the best place to find us at C Microcaps. As I said, YouTube for the recording of this webinar and indeed all our previous webinars. Uh, LinkedIn, I do some additional long form content there. And I also write a weekly paid newsletter uh, where I profile one interesting ASX Microcap stock every week. And you can find that on the Substack newsletter platform. So our first presenter this morning is Lewis Utting, CEO and MD of Skydev. And then straight after Lewis, we're going to have, welcoming back actually, Ruskell Baskerville, the MD of Empire from Perth. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm just going to quickly get uh, Lewis's presentation up here quick. Uh, second. Hey, Lewis, I've got your cover slide up, so I'm ready to drive this uh, uh, as you are. Thanks, Mark. Um, good morning, everyone, and thanks again for making uh, the time today. Uh, my name is Lewis Hutting. I'm the Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of Sidev. It's a really exciting time for Sidev right now, and it's a pleasure to be taking you through our business this morning. Um, for the benefit of those who haven't heard about Sidev before, I'll start with an introduction to our business and I'll also spend a bit of time talking about our recent acquisition of Halden Industries, which we announced last month. At the conclusion of the presentation, I'm happy to open the lines to your questions to make the session uh, more interactive um, and we'll take you through our business in a little bit more detail. Um, if you can flick to slide three, Mark. So Sidev is all about making water work harder. We help a range of industries deal with issues as they relate to water, whether it's to do with their production processes, process performance, or pollution control. Our philosophy is to work with our customers to understand their specific requirements and deliver bespoke solutions to solve their water problems. What that means is, or broadly speaking, we provide three key services. Um, the first of which is, 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 is chemistry, um, which is is a range of proprietary chemicals and, and polymers, um, professional services uh, where we design, uh, we use that time or those services to design bespoke chemical solutions and applications that specifically meet the unique requirements of our, of our clients and then engineering and process control. Um, so that's hardware on site. Um, so we're, our, our, our clients may need um, support with some process control solutions and specialized pumping capability or specialized tanks that type of thing so there are three elements to that overall water solution um, the industries or the verticals that we target um, uh, mining and mineral processing um, oil and gas 
you know, infrastructure and construction and water and wastewater. I'll take you through each one of the verticals in, in more detail um, shortly and, and, and what we do in each specific one. But in short, if on the right of the slide rather, our financial growth has been really impressive um, and it's been driven by a combination of organic growth and strategic acquisitions. Um, our, our first half FY21 revenue tripled to over 18 million, um, which is a result uh, I'm, I'm very proud of, especially considering um, the global uh, environment with COVID. Um, we've had a massive, we've got a massive opportunity in front of us, um, and I've got no doubt that the business will continue to deliver strong growth um, for years to come, especially as the world um, begins to open up a little bit more. Slide four, please, Mark. Mm -hmm. If we look at slide four, it, it gives you a bit of an overview on, on the verticals um, that I mentioned earlier. It, it breaks down these each, what is a very large addressable market. Um, in mining and mineral processing, we're the market leader in solids liquid separation, which basically ensures that uh, minimal water is, is wasted or passed as waste into, into tailing circuits or discharge. So we optimize the recovery of that water and minimize those waste volumes. Uh, in, in, in oil and gas, we focus on solutions that, that optimise oil field uh, water waste and help our clients um, in the onshore market uh, produce more oil uh, more efficiently. In infrastructure and, const in, and construction, um, we improve efficiency with dewatering chemistry solutions. So, so what that might mean is, um, say, tunnel boring applications um, or, or construction dewatering jobs. Um, we help uh, we help those processes. We deliver those outcomes more efficiently for our clients. And then water out and wastewater, which is currently the smallest contributor uh, to our revenue profile, but it's a, obviously the largest um, has, has the largest addressable market. So, with the recent acquisition of Halden, <clears throat> we're focused on on the removal of uh, persistent organic pollutants, nutrients, and heavy metals, as as well as some dewatering opportunities. Um, if, I, if I break those markets down um, by, uh, by, by geography as well, we, we look at, you know, onshore oil and gas is largely in, in North America and, and water and wastewater um, both is, is largely driven by infrastructure um, or, or, or development um, the, and population. So large centres such as North America, Europe, um, and, and then some parts of Asia as well. We move to slide six, specifically about um, Howden Industries. Um, the key rationale for the acquisition of Howden was to broaden our exposure in that you know six billion dollar vertical. The, the Howden the Howden business or provides uh, the Howden business provides Cider with access to to the growing um, PFAS market, which is a persistent organic pollutant or, or what's commonly referred to as a forever chemical. So there are a, a group of man-made chemistries that uh, are, are tolerant to heat, are tolerant to oil and tolerant to other solvents and they remain in, um, in groundwater um, and, and last forever unless they're removed. And, and they cause problems such as you know, things that you see in the, the Westgate Tunnel in Melbourne here in Australia and, um, and other places as well. So. Um, and Halden's unique offer is, is, is really attractive um, for us that so we're able to provide that, that solution and help scale that. Um, we also gain access to a, to a team of, well, now we've got a team, sorry, combined of, of 50 skilled people. So engineers and chemists and project managers that are able to provide solutions to our customers. And we can leverage that skill set across SIDEB's verticals. Um, you know, and, and, and cross-sell into different customers to provide those end-to-end -end solutions or full treatment solutions for our, our clients. The other thing that the um, that uh, the Howden acquisition delivers us is the ability to leverage our our you know manufacturing and supply chain um, and back office functions. So that things like um, you know there are consumables or there's chemistry used in the Howden business. Obviously, where we have really well-defined uh, supply chains um, and, and, and we've got a man our own manufacturing footprints. Um, so that's really, it's really quite exciting um, for us as well. And then obviously the back office functions. Um, the incremental uh, growth opportunities, um, you know, leveraging Howden's differentiated technology. 
through Zydev's existing network is quite exciting for us as well. So, you know, if we think about, um, you know, the, the, the current Zydev customer base in, in North America, I um, mean, oil and gas, and, and if I look at um, the, where we have some, uh, our footprint in mining, which is just exceptional, um, it, it's a really exciting opportunity for us um, to, to, to leverage um, the way Howden do business. We go to slide seven. Mark. Um, so Howden generally operate in four segments and, and going forward, they'll all fit under the umbrella of Sidev's water vertical. Um, they, again, they provide an overarching solution to, to their customers, which includes general water treatment, um, you know, um, groundwater dewatering, removal of contaminants and, and liquid waste treatment. They've been very successful in providing these unique services um, and, and growth over the last several years with positive EBITDA and, and have essentially grown from cash flow. Um, and go to slide eight, please, Mark. I want to take you through a little bit more with the, with the opportunity that PFAS um, represents to us and how Howden and Sidev play a crucial role in that. So PFAS is a, a major concern for a lot of mining infrastructure and construction projects in Australia and, and around the world. Uh, what Howden have been able to do is, is quite exceptional, really. They've, they've been very successful um, in creating significant value in, in that market by coming up with internally developed and tailored um, processes uh, to, for each project that's having to deal with um, a PFAS challenge. And, and in doing so, they've been able to um, outcompete major, um, you know, major water treatment businesses. Um, but, but what I'm most excited about with Howden um, and, and the approach to their business is that it, it's the most efficient strategy on a commercial scale in Australia. And, and what I mean by that is the, the, the resulting um, waste volumes, if you like, are, um, uh, uh, we can concentrate the waste, you know, almost a hundred times greater than, than any other business. And the residual levels that are, that are left behind are, are below the detection limits that we can measure in the laboratory. And not, there's nobody else that's been able to achieve that on a commercial scale, um, uh, such as Halden. So that was, you know, one of the most attractive things for, um, for, for Sidev and, and why we wanted to um, partner with them and, and to, to broaden that, that water vertical. Um, slide nine, please, Mark. To, to open it up a little bit, I mean, on the top of the slide there, you can see what I talk about when, you know, we about that, that waste concent, concentration rather and, and how we're able to um, do it to a smaller volume. And waste generally is about um, immobilising the waste or reducing the volume of it um, to, to be dealt with in another way. And, and, and that's effectively what um, PFAS, is, PFAS removal is all about. It's, it's removing it from... Um, stopping it from being mobile, whether that's in soil or groundwater, um, then concentrating it to a, to, to a volume that's, that's readily destroyed um, using sort of uh, pyrolysis type techniques. Um, but it, it, the real synergy between the two businesses is in order for, say, a, um, a PFAS to be removed, you, you need to remove the, the solids in the water first. And that's something that CITEV's, you know, been, or we're experts in, um, removing the, the vis visible particles that you can see in, in wastewater and how uh, have the technology and, and the skill set to remove the pollutants that you cannot see. Um, so it's quite a, quite a neat fit. Um, and this allows us to provide that, that comprehensive water treatment solution to our customers and reduce those wastewater volumes to a fraction of its initial volume. And it's, the combined technology doesn't... Um, doesn't just result in less liquid waste, but it also results in reduced disposal costs. Um, and importantly, the environmental footprint of the process is reduced as the treated water um, is then reused for either irrigation or, or, or dust suppression. Um, slide 13, please, Mark. Next. So there's a significant opportunity for, for CIDEV and, you know, the global colloid commodity market, if, we, if you call it that, is, which is a sort of sector that we directly touch, is, is over $11 billion uh, US and 
and we believe that we can we can achieve greater than one percent market share in this in this vertical, um, presenting us with some significant um, significant growth upside. Slide fourteen, please, Craig. Uh, Mark, so. um, we've got a robust pipeline. Um, it includes several significant field validation type trials. Uh, and our team are currently conducting. Um, you know, we're 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 working with FMG uh, field with field validations of our technology at their Solomon Hub, and we're currently on site and active with BHP um, Olympic Dam, which is one of their largest assets. Um, and our ongoing contracts and e existing customers are all blue chip uh, blue chip customers such as Shell, um, Exxon, where we have some of our experts deployed providing professional services. Um, and then in mining, uh, Aluka and Aramet, where we have um, our chemistry in play. Um, I think it's important to point out that our business development pipeline can sort of runs, um, you know, between six, six to 18 months. And, and, and after that, um, you know, we, we, we've got a fairly defined, we've got a very, very defined instruction process in the way we approach it. So um, it's, it's good to see our customers or the market voting with their feet. If you like, and and, and some, some of those blue chip clients starting to convert and, and come through. So I, I think now, Mark, I'm I'm happy to go to Q and A if that's um if, if we, that's can, a, we we can do that. I'm just I just want to see um have you got a a cunt? Yeah, I might just leave up this slide here, Lewis. If if anybody wants to note down contact details for um, after the presentation. Um, we have one or two questions ahead of time. So let me just do those while I'm waiting for uh, questions come in from the audience. Um, regarding the Canadian oil sand project trial or, or field trial as you call it, um, the question is, is the potential client already using a less pricey off the shelf chemical product? Uh, but looking for an alternative, better performing, performing solution, sorry, or are they not using anything at the moment? So the, 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 it's specifically in the Canadian oil sands, they're using an existing chemistry. Um, are they looking for a, a less pricier offer or a more efficient, um, you know, a, a better performing um, process uh, that that's what we're targeting is a better performing product whether it's um you know more at the total cost of operation um we'd like to we'd obviously like to reduce and make that attractive for the customer but whether that's a cheaper chemistry or not is sort of um yeah not the the, the client sort of focused on that total cost of operation and that's what we're focusing on but they are using um they are using an existing one of our competitors at the moment okay great and then uh, another question regarding uh, further acquisitions, uh, would the focus be on expanding, you know, products to sell into current verticals or would it be buying something that gets you into a new industry vertical altogether outside of the, the four that you, you're currently focused on? It's a, a good question. I, I think if we, Folk, the reason we chose the four verticals that we operate in is, is we have synergies with specific chemistry types and, and, and technical problems. So um, we, we talked about um, we talked about having uh, solid liquid separation processes ahead of PFAS or organic removal type challenges. And, and one way to think about it is if um, you know we we might have we have common wastes in those those industries and, and common problems and common uh, consumable supply chain. So that's why we, we, we focused on, on those verticals and we expanded inorganically or first organically into the oil sector um, with sales uh, product con uh, proof of concept trials in, I think it was August, 2019. We then acquired, um, made the acquisition of Highland Fluids to sort of provide us with that, that industry specific skill set. Um, again, if we look at the Halden, uh, the Halden acquisition, that was a, around providing that yeah, industry specific skill set um, and then pulling through those those common supply chains um, and, and, and common um, you know, some other common engineering skills um, 
that we can supply. So in terms of further acquisitions, I, I think um, the business has grown really well in, uh, organically. We've made some um, inorganic in transactions to, to bolster our, our, our offer, but really, I, I think for now, um, our business is well set up to scale. Um, where we would look at where there are inorganic opportunities are obviously, you know, customer client access and, and, and sort of geographic type things. But, um, but from a from a um, adding new verticals to the to the pipeline right now, there's none on the none on the horizon. We're we're, we're comfortable. We're going to stick to our knitting with what we're really good at, and um, yeah, it's quite exciting for us. I think. Okay, got one from the audience, uh, Lewis, and uh, there was a large cash outflow in Q1 21, but then quasi positive cash flow in Q2 and, and Q3. Um, what was the reason for the large outflow in Q1? Is capital expenditure seasonal? It's a really, really, really good question and um, you know, really insightful. So I think if we go back to um, in March uh, 2020, you, you know, we, we, we just acquired a business in, in North America, which was, um, which was Highland Fluids in, in the oil field at that time. Um, I think it was January, actually, we closed the transaction. We made a decision in, in February that we needed to um, bolster our inventories there in North America. And at the same time, I think the, the oil market was, was decimated maybe several weeks afterwards. So if we look at our full uh, our FY 2019 results, you'll see that we, um, we lent on our balance sheet um, considerably. So we, you know, we, we obviously pulled pull through our AR and um, you know, pushed our, our AP um, and, you, I, I, and then the, that September quarter result um, is, is essentially us cleaning up our balance sheet from that inventory holding where we, so, you know, I think we, we I think we had um, our AR was 2.5 and our AP was around 8 million at the end of, um, end of FY19. And then if you look at the, where our AR and AP sat um, in that, the end of that September quarter, I think it normalized to about uh, four and five or something. So that cash outflow was around um, just covering, covering that large inventory spend that we basically got caught with during COVID. Um, and then since then, the business has is, is continued to, um, to, to, jet, to net cash. Now it's normalised. Um, in terms of seasonality in the business, um, there's always a bit of seasonality in the oil business in, in North America. Um, but from a, for, from a cash flow perspective, I think there's a really good slide, um, Mark, if you, if you go through, yeah. click through, if you go forward a couple of slides on the, on, in the appendix there, yeah, that one. Um, oh, sorry. You're, yeah. <laughs> Typically in our business, you can see that, that um, cash follows revenue quite quite nicely. And if, again, if you look at that fourth quarter FY20 and Q1 um, FY21, you can see that um, you know our, our revenue in in the fourth quarter um, FY20 was um, 5.5 million, and then the quarter following it was only 5.6 million. Um, that's normalised now, um, but you can see if we're low on sales, we're going to be shorter on cash. And if we're low, if we if, if we're lower on sales, and you know we've got AP, um, then obviously there's going to be a cash uh, a cash drain as well. So from our perspective, that's um, yeah, cash follows sales pretty well, and we've had uh, I think the last the, the March quarter, which isn't in that slide. Um, I think we had 11.3 and 11.2 um, revenue beat cash receipts. So started to normalize in that trend, that little blip in the radar that you can see there, we can just, we can put down to um, uh, the adjustment in the oil field during COVID. Okay, great. And then uh, maybe if I can put in one question, um, per, on a, how do contracts normally, normally run? Is it on a per project basis or, is it you know a, a three-year tender contract that's you know up for renewal? How how does contracting normally work? It's a, a it's a great question. Um, I'll start with mining. Uh, mining can, can be a uh, competitive tender type process, which sometimes we can be the catalyst for with the work that we do. And and, and those contracts are typically uh, two plus one, three plus one, or or can be five years in some cases. Um, in the oil field, um, you know, we operate under master service agreements with um, sort of 90-day 
um, project type contracts um, and, and then in infrastructure and construction, uh, again, it's, it, it's those um, project based contracts. So if you're digging a tunnel for two years, then the, the, the contract's going to be for two years, the life of the project. Um, and water and wastewater, some of the and that you sort of had those, those smaller contracts, uh, you know, 90 day, 180 day contracts um, that run consecutively one after the other for the life of the project, you know, depending on different where the, where the stages are of the project. So, okay, so it kind of uh, it varies by vertical, basically. Yeah, it, it varies by vertical, but the you know the largest proportion, the larger proportion of our revenue is recurring in the business than not. So. Okay. okay, if we don't have uh, any further questions, I'll give us a minute here from the audience. No, it doesn't look like it. Okay, Lewis, I think we will leave it there because I know our next presenter is, is waiting in the wings, so we can uh, start a minute or two early as needs be. Lewis, thank you very much for, for coming on. I'll just put up the contact details again if uh, anybody wants to reach out to yourself or Craig from Market Eye. Thanks, Mark. Cheers. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and I will get Russell to Russell if you or David if you can start sharing the presentation it would be great. I'm still on mute. Hi, Mark. I will do that now. Okay, thanks, Russell. Welcome back. Thanks for joining us once again. Now you're good, morning. good morning, everybody. I have my coffee, obligatory coffee for the coffee micro cap session. Thank you. So we have um, so from uh, Empire we've got Russell Baskerville, the CEO, and we're also joined by uh, David Hinton, the CFO. Okay, here we go. And then if you can just flip to Thank you. Presentation. I have a quick slideshow. It's just taking its time. Or maybe it didn't click. You should be seeing that now, Mark. Yeah, we're in uh, full screen now, Russell. Wonderful. Well, that was pretty smooth. Mark, thank you for inviting us along to, again uh, this morning. And welcome everyone to the presentation. We appreciate your time. <clears throat> For those that don't know, uh, Empire is a, a digital services company operating right across Australia and New Zealand. Uh, we've been listed for a number of years now and, and have had a, a pretty exciting 10 year journey. So I thought that I would start by giving you a little bit of an overview around where we've come from, uh, you know, where we are today, where the market is and what we're seeing is really exciting into the, into the next number of years. <clears throat> I founded 10 years ago as a, uh, a small IT services business you know, with really a, a goal of becoming the, the most respected digital services company across Australia. And we really did that early by focusing on large multi-year contracts that could generate annuity revenue for us. And today that, that continues to be a very primary goal of the business. And I think a key differentiator for our business is the level of annuity and recurring revenue. Uh, we, we, we successfully secured some contracts, started to grow and knew that if we wanted to be a, a larger national player, founded in Western Australia, we had to build out presence across the East Coast. We primarily did that through a number of acquisitions. Those acquisitions did a couple of things. Firstly, they broadened the capability that we had from being a, a, a more of an infrastructure services provider to an applications and software provider which we think in today's market has been critical to our success. And, and then also building out offices right across the East Coast of Australia, every major capital city and throughout New Zealand as well. We then, and, and, and that largely drove that, that really high growth period between 2013 and 2018. And we, we've then gone into a, a, a more of a consolidation phase where we've ensured that we've got you know, the right tools and systems right across the organisation or what I would call the platform of the business to ensure the next phase of growth is predictable and well controlled, is profitable. Um, and so we've, we've started to come out of that today. We've done a lot of work around 
the positioning of our business in the market, ensuring our, our services portfolio and sales model is correct and starting to align our services and solutions with industry, with industry requirements. So, you know, I think out of the back of that, uh, you've, you've seen Empire now secure the, the largest contract that it has in its history recently with Western Power. Uh, phenomenal win, and, and we actually went on to win another contract a number of months later with Western Power as well, which I'll talk about shortly. Um, but I think all of that work has resulted in the business being well aligned to growth trends in the market, having a, a highly predictable set of services and uh, and starting to see some phenomenal growth. I mean, growth this year will, will be up solidly on prior years. Sales growth for the first half up 35%. And uh, as I mentioned, a number of very, very large multi-year contract wins, one of those up to seven years, that really haven't contributed to that first half result that will start to contribute to revenue as we go forward. So what does the business look like today? We are the largest dedicated Microsoft services provider across ANZ. I'm going to talk a lot about Microsoft today. Uh, I think there's an enormous growth opportunity alongside Microsoft. Uh, we organise into four key sort of go-to-market services. The first is around modern work and security. Modern work is really anything that touches the cloud from an end user device perspective and all of the security that secures the data and applications that, that go alongside that. So that may be a, a, a mobile application that sits on a um, on, on you know a thousand users' phone to access a corporate system. It may be a, a desktop solution that runs in the office, um, but it's anything to do with a device that is connected to the cloud. The, the second part of our business is around digital and data. And this, this business really is around custom application development using uh, large data sets. And we're seeing the, the growth in data being produced by organisations continually to exp exponentially uh, grow. And uh, there's huge opportunities to gain significant insights from what's happening in organisations or around organisations' customers and use that data to make intelligent decisions on how they're running and operating their business. The, the third is what we call business applications. And business applications really for us is a Microsoft Dynamics business. It operates their ERP, which is Enterprise Resource Planning, and uh, CRM, Customer Relationship Management products is what we take to market and we provide the, the design and implementation services around those solutions. And those solutions typically are for finance and operations, putting in new finance systems for companies, putting in supply chain management systems for companies, warehouse management systems for companies um, and, and building that out. And the fourth line of business for us is these cloud platforms and cloud platforms uh, really is all around the, the, the secure storage of data, it's the processing player of data, and it's the platform to build applications in the cloud. So they're the key lines of service that we take to market. And you know, our view is that we have, we have built a set of services that, that are a modern set of services that are aligning to market trends that we're seeing today and high demand or growth areas, as opposed to you know, a number of legacy IT services that many of our competitors continue to have. I guess a number of the key competitive advantages or differentiators that I see our business uh, you know, possess in the market. First, firstly, it's got to be around this uh, digital, digital transformation to digital operations shift. So, you know, we have capability all the way from the, the, the very early stages of ideation around a solution and, you know, business analysts and strategists that work with large enterprise to better understand where we can where we can use technology to impact change for their, all their, their organisation, right through to the development and building out of those solutions. And some of these solutions can be you know, many tens of millions of dollars over a number of years through to running and maintaining those solutions for customers. Um, you know, a great example would be where we're running a, um, you know, for a very large iron ore miner, we're running all of the technical systems that are, that are managing the larger, the single large iron ore processing plant in the world. And at the same time, we're modernizing all of those systems, taking them to the cloud, ensuring that they're secured. And that's a, a very long-term multi-year program. Uh, I, met, I mentioned Western Power earlier. That's an organization where we're running 
all of the all of the key uh, digital and te technology assets to to support the power distribution right across Western Australia. And then we are we are also working with them around a number of digital modernisation efforts, whether whether that is things like you know um, online customer engagement and predictive systems, through to how do we better understand uh, how weather affects the power the, the power lines and and increases uptime of electricity. So there's a whole range of things that we can do in that in that space, and I think that that's that's key to our value proposition, being able to not only uh, do one part of the puzzle, but actually work with a customer over that entire journey. We have a range of industry-based solutions where we have IP that we have developed in-house that allows certain industries to buy solutions from us with a very predictable outcome and a faster time to value, a faster time to building a solution because we, we have these packaged uh, uh, solutions that we can immediately table with a customer. And I, and I think that the third one and a very important one has got to be this deep expertise across the three Microsoft connected clouds that I'll talk to today. The business is about a thousand people. Primarily, primarily, it's an Australian New Zealand company. We have some uh, small operations in the USA, but strategically focused on building our business out in Australia and New Zealand. And you know, over the next kind of three-year horizon, you want to see us entering new markets to grow the business. Uh, we have a, a strong base of sticky, predictable revenue. Over sixty percent of revenue comes from long-term, multi-year contracts. Uh, the balance of revenue is highly predictable. I would suggest 90, 97, 98% of the balance of revenue is from repeat customers every year. Um, whilst, whilst not annuity or contracted, those, those programs and those customers often have many, many projects running over many years. So I think we've got a pretty exciting platform. If I look at the market today, you know, particularly coming out of COVID, you know, digital is a is, is a an extremely hot market. You know, we, we're seeing the prioritisation of digital initiatives by large corporate and government organisations, any tertiary education institutions globally around the world, as at the boardroom table as a key item of conversation. What what are we doing about taking our products and services online? How do we ensure that we engage with our with our community? with our uh, end users or with our customers in a digital way and how we're we doing that in a secure way where people can access that data from anywhere. And so that's driving enormous demand for our business. And you know, pretty excited to say that if I sit here and look across what I would divide as our three key markets, Australian East Coast, Australian West Coast and New Zealand, all of those markets are performing very well from a, a demand perspective. First half results were solid, revenue up 7%. Yeah, EBITDA ex JobKeeper support up 43%. I think that's probably the key number to look at, but a very solid result. MPAT up obviously uh, solidly on the back of those two things. I think the, the, the big standout here for me is operating cash flow, you know, through what, what probably was a still at that stage a bit of an uncertain time and, you know, customers holding on to money, you know, for us to, to achieve, you know, cash conversion at these levels and have operating cash flow of seven and a half million dollars for the first half up nearly 60 percent great result and the, and for the first time in the in the business is listed history going into a net cash position of circa seven million dollars has also been an outstanding outcome um, and a payment of a dividend on on the back of a, a very solid first half just quickly touching on the split of the business you know about 62 percent of our businesses across australia 38 percent in new zealand 38% of our business comes from running and maintaining core applications and systems for customers. 62% is in digital transformation initiatives, which is more project-based, although many of those projects are multi-year in nature. Uh, I, I won't talk about the, the split in, in too much detail, other than to say it's interesting when you see a slide a little further down that 33% of our revenue being the business application space and 31% of our revenue around that data space, two highest growth businesses that, that we hold by far and, and also the, the significant proportion of the company, which I think is pretty exciting. I mentioned this, <clears throat> this Western Power win, uh, you know, going back probably nine months ago now, uh, I, I think transitioning something of this size was always you know, a concern for, for our shareholders. I'm pleased to sit here nine months later and say that 
you know, this has been a very successful transition, no downtime. Uh, we've, we've taken on provision of services across all of the core infrastructure at Western Power. And uh, when we're not seeing, um, you know, the customer is very happy. Uh, we're meeting all of our SLAs. And from a financial perspective, I think that at this stage, it's probably exceeding our expectations, which, is, which has been fantastic, both revenue and margin. Uh, but what, what I think really talks volumes to that is, is you know, six months later, uh, three or four months ago now, Western Power actually trusted us with the systems integrator panel that we were awarded. And we announced that and really got no reaction from the market. Um, and, and I understand why, you know, it's got no commitment to work. There were no dollar values prescribed to it. However, I guess I can say that, you know, from my perspective, the work under this contract is ramping up. There are two other major providers also providing services to Western Power in this space. And for me, this is probably the most exciting contract that the company holds. You know, it has phenomenal, phenomenal potential. So very, very excited about what we're doing with Western Power in that space under that contract. Russ, just um, before you move off Western Power, there's a question in the chat here saying on the second Western Power contract, meaning that one, what is, what is the contestable revenue pie between Empire and other contractors to that contract? Look, David, I, I, I think it's, probably um, not right of me to, to mm. quote Western Power budgeted figures. No. Um, but what, what I can say is that, you know, it, it is materially more than the first contract that we have won. So it is a very significant opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, if, if I look at our customer base, this is another huge standout. You know, three years ago, yeah, we would have been absolutely wrapped to have one customer doing $10 million per rev of revenue per annum with us. Today, we have you know, four, four accounts that are on track between them to contribute greater than $50 million in revenue in FY21, all operating very, very healthy margins. Um, and then below that, an outstanding list of contract customers and contracts that are really generating revenues somewhere between your one and 10, I guess, um, which is all very, very substantial in its own right. And I'll talk a little bit about that when you see the customer um, spread map shortly. Sales in the first half up 31%. This is an absolutely exceptional result. Um, you know, we were, we were delighted with that sales result. Um, to, it's probably the start, strongest sales result. And remember, this is not revenue, it's the sales, but probably the strongest sales result that we have had in 10 years. So it was an outstanding result and uh, well ahead of target as well. One thing that I find really interesting is you know, when you have a crack of sales result, typically you find that your pipeline drops because you've, you've, you've won all the work, right? You've closed it. But at the, at the period, at the, at, the, at the end of the December, it was sales up 34%. Sales pipeline was also up at the same time, 45%. So, you know, I think that's, that's a real indicator to the strength of the market today and how the business is performing in the market and uh, a real indicator, hopefully, to future growth. I want to touch on Microsoft. Microsoft, obviously, is, is our largest technology partner. You know, we, we work with Microsoft across almost all of their, their core go-to-market products. Um, and this is an organisation that, that is performing incredibly well. I mean, it, it, it is the... It's, it's the third most valuable organisation in the world at $1.7 trillion market capitalisation. It regularly swaps with, with Apple. Apple's currently capitalised about $1.9 trillion. They, they swap spots a bit, so sometimes it's the second most valuable uh, and second only to Saudi Aramco. So pretty phenomenal business, $143 billion in annual revenue growing consistently at 15%. When you think about the size of revenue in the market and, and that they can continue to grow up 15% year in, year out, I, I also think that's a pretty exciting opportunity in that, in, in that growth. Um, and, and then I think the other thing to really understand about what Microsoft are doing is you know, really the core of their business is still very much you know, software and applications being used across global organisations all over the world right, to run their core business. And, and they're in a journey to the cloud. And you know, research shows that this journey to the cloud is only really about 15% adopted by global organisations so far. So you think we've been talking about the cloud for, for 10 years, globally maybe we've got 15% of the way through that. That means we've got a huge runway of opportunity. 
and Microsoft are supporting tens of millions of clients globally to move to their intelligent cloud. And that's a phenomenal shift for the, the second or third most, most valuable company in the world to be, to be transforming their entire organization uh, to the cloud and all of their customers to the cloud. It's a, it's a huge opportunity. And I think our, you know, our position with Microsoft is, is somewhat unique. You know, we have a thousand certified Microsoft cloud professionals uh, across what they call their three connected clouds. And, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the importance of that shortly. Um, we have a very deep relationship with Microsoft in this market and, and they are looking for partners that have local expertise, local networks, staff on the ground that can respond quickly and help them help them take their clients on this journey. So, so I think it's a massive opportunity. Really, Microsoft are, are, are betting, making three big bets, and that is that they will take you know, all of their clients over time into the cloud across three secure clouds that will be interconnected. The first is their Microsoft 365 cloud, and that is really their what they call their productivity cloud. So any Microsoft application that you see on a device, be that you know, Office, for example, Excel, for example, Microsoft Teams, as an example, all sit within the 365 cloud. But then have their Dynamics Cloud, which is really all around business operations and customer engagement. That's their, their, their ERP products, their CRM solutions, all sit in that Microsoft Dynamics Cloud. And then they have the, the Microsoft Azure Cloud. And, and often people think Microsoft, they think cloud, they just think Azure. Actually, Azure is simply the, the kind of what we would call the intelligent infrastructure. So it's around real-time real -time data storage and processing. It's around security. Um, and and it's around it's around compute power. Now I I think so. So so that's that's where Microsoft are taking taking their organisation. That's the three clouds that that exist today for Microsoft. But I think the real value is people that can build solutions for customers that connect all three. And if you if you have a look at our credentials, you know we we are one of the most certified partners across Australia and New Zealand. Um, this actually means that Microsoft provide financial support if they deal with us because they believe that the, the solutions that are being built have a higher likelihood of uh, being successful and delivering the required benefits to customers. And so they'll actually provide financial support if a customer elects to do work with Empire. So it's, it, it also improves our, our commercial advantage. And then if I look, uh, if I look at Empire across those three connected clouds, as I said, you know, I think I think the big value proposition that we have is this this incubation planning and ideation phase. We can work with customers to understand how technology can have real impact to their business, and then we can build them out solutions that may involve, you know, a new supply chain management system in in an ERP solution using the Microsoft Dynamics Cloud. But then we can connect real time data analytics to that to that system using the Microsoft 365 Cloud fully integrated into the, uh, the Microsoft Dynamics Cloud. Uh, and we can store all of that data in a secure way in Microsoft Azure um, and, and have real-time data applications running out of that Azure platform, having uh, you know, advanced intelligence and machine learning applications running in that Azure platform, delivering you know, real insights down to the Microsoft 365 uh, you know, applications running on a, on a desktop or a, or a mobile device. So it becomes a very, very powerful solution. And then as we move through that journey and we've built the solution, Empire has a, a managed services model that not only allows customers to have us maintain and support those solutions, but we have what we call a, a continuous evolution uh, standard, which we, which we engage with customers on. And that allows us to continually be building and developing new enhancements to those solutions. So I think if we look at a legacy tech piece of technology, you build it, you put it in, you run it for five or six years, the business requirements change, you throw that in, you spend another 20 million bucks, you build something new, right? Today, what we do is we build it, or we, we, we come up with the concept, we build it, we put it into run and maintain, but instead of leaving it, we have a, a program of continual engagement with their business and continuing to enhance the products and ser or the services that are available to that business. So in five or seven years time, the product has retained significant value and is still meeting the requirements of the business. So it's a very different way in which that we're, we're going to market around that, that ongoing multi-year engagement with customers. It's not just about run and maintain, it's about run and maintain and continue to enhance. 
So the Microsoft Connected Clouds, let's remember all three of these are multi, multi billion dollar global businesses. The, the Azure Cloud, 50% growth last you know, um, in Q2 year on year, right? Phenomenal growth on a multi billion dollar business. Office 365 up 20%, Dynamics 365 up 40%. I mean, when you put it in context, these are multi billion dollar businesses growing at these sorts of growth rates. It's got to mean there's pretty significant opportunities for Empire to start to capture some of those that growth in the local Australian market, New Zealand market, as that starts to happen down in, locally. So we're seeing that our Microsoft uh, Dynamics business, which really sits in business applications, up 15% in the first half, and you know we're very pleased to say it's continuing to have a very strong performance in the second half. The digital and data business up 9%. And again, we, we're seeing continued growth in that business. The platforms business was impacted by a loss that we had in the prior financial year. So what you've seen here is that loss come out and you've seen only a very small contribution from Western Power replacing it coming in. As you see that move into the second half, I think you'll see some dramatic improvement in the growth rates of that platforms business. Um, and I'm, I'm very confident on a very solid full year result there. And then the modern workplace business, you know, slight, slightly down for us. And I think fair to say we've, we've put a lot of focus in the data space and the business application space. Um, and we need to start to shift some real focus around that modern workplace business, because again, it is a huge growth opportunity that, that today uh, we think we, we have all of the capability to capture and we need to go and execute on that. I've spoken about strong sales results. You can see across all of our regions, our sales results have been strong. Um, I, I think the key takeaway here is, you know, the East Coast, 8% is actually a, a pretty damn good result. And a year ago, I'd be crying about that. But, you know, compared to the other two key regions, it doesn't look that great. I think you'll see that. I mean, I made a comment here, Australian East Coast pipeline up 116% at the point of, at, at December. I mean, that tells me we, we, sales can only go up. Um, I think it'll be a much, much stronger result on the full year around East Coast sales performance. We're, we're pretty pleased to be reporting that when we do. Excited to do that. Um, I spoke a little bit about this customer base and you see here kind of vertically, the blue, the orange, the gray, the yellow being those, those four top customers. But if you then look behind those customers, you've got that light blue, the, the green, and then along the, the horizontal line at the top, the blue, the red, the gray, Etc., and then vertically down, down the, the below that dark blue, still some very significant customers spending consistently. Now, let, let's say between two and two and seven, eight million dollars per annum each with us, and that's an enormous growth opportunity for us. They're, they're obviously large corporate organizations that we're dealing with that are prioritizing digital initiatives and, and working in a significant way with Empire. And so I think the big opportunity for us is not necessarily about trying to capture new clients. It's about doing more with an incredible customer base that's obviously starting to trust us more and more. So I think it's a great opportunity. So just a quick outlook. I mean, we do have strong demand today um, and that is driving a tightening labor market you know we're not seeing too much upward pressure on rates currently um, however i do think that that will come which obviously can provide some some gross margin tightening uh, but we are passing that on we're seeing uh, upward bias on rates on a consistent quarterly basis slowly tracking up so i think that you know it's not concerning me i think the bigger concern here is not uh, gross margin erosion. Actually, our rates are, are continuing to go up. My concern is actually uh, access to high quality talent slowing our ability to grow. And so we've got a range of programs we're running around not, not only securing new talent, but also making sure we keep hold of the great people that we have. Um, from a client perspective, you know, they're after long-term partnerships. They're looking to engage with, with us in a in a in a in a programmatic way where they would have a number of initiatives that they want to deliver over a number of years instead of saying we've got one piece of work that we want to go and do. So that, that's great for us and it's great for the customer. It means the customer has a an ability to engage with us in a more strategic way and secure uh, consistency of high caliber staff working on on their on their projects. And for and for us it means that we have you know, improve utilisation and better ability to manage our resource forecasting. Um, I, I think 
winning in this market is very important. There's a huge opportunity and really leveraging the IP that we've developed and really telling the story around the breadth of capability that we have has, has got to be unique around how we go and capitalize on this market. And, and actually responding to this market, we'll see some investment in sales as well and continue to build out our sales capability, which, which is extensive, but I just think you'll see a, 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 an increase in the sales force itself and some of the key practice leads and principles that sit behind those, those sales people. From a financial perspective, I'm, I'm not going to read all of this out, out. You know, we had a good first half. I think we'll have a pretty good second half. The business is growing and, and really excited to see it continue to grow into next year. Mark, I think that's that's all from me. Okay, great. Thanks, Russell. We have a few from the audience. I know David put one to you as we were going through on the Western Power one, but let's just tackle some of the others. Um, can you talk about the maturity of the sales pipeline of larger managed service contracts? Uh, the maturity of the pipeline, it's, that's, um, well, 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 I think if you're saying, is there a deal around the corner? There's always a deal around the corner. It depends if we win one or not. But um, look, we, it, it's, we, we do have a very exciting um, larger deal or, or managed services pipeline at the moment. Um, you know, we would have off the top of my head, half a dozen contracts of significant size in play right now, where we're at uh, differing stages, whether that's tender submitted or whether that's, you know, shortlisted. And, and there are some in that, in that state. Um, and that, you know, I would like to think that, that we will have some success in converting that pipeline over the coming months. Okay. And then I, I think you kind of alluded to this, uh, but maybe uh, just for for clarity the difference between being a, a higher tier microsoft partner and um, does that mean you also get fed more leads directly from microsoft or is it just the the financial support that you referenced in, in one of the slides i don't i don't think microsoft would ever say they give one partner more leads than the other <laughs> because yeah but but but, cert, but certainly in in practice uh, absolutely. I mean, we we have people in in all of our offices around Australia and New Zealand that are dedicated to working alongside uh, Microsoft folk, uh, engaging with customers all of the time. So, you know, we and and Microsoft obviously work with partners where they have confidence in the success of the outcome and they want Microsoft to look good, right? Um, so so yeah. Look, I I think it's fair to say I don't think that you'll find anywhere formally that says they'll give us more leads than anyone else, uh, Mark, but, but absolutely. I mean, you know, we are working hand in hand with Microsoft every day on all of their major, I wouldn't say all of their major opportunities, but a very large proportion of major opportunities. And then maybe one for me, for, for David, I think, uh, or maybe Rush, you might know the answer to it. Um, just on the dividend policy, I know you're, you're trying to move up the payout ratio over time and the, uh, Interim dividend was on Frank. How close are you to getting to paying out uh, Frank dividends again? David, I'll let you answer that. Just given I've done a lot of talking. <laughs> it's probably um, it's probably a, a year away, Mark. We've we've received um, quite a few R and D benefits along the journey with our investment in the business and investment in you know technology and solutions for customers, and that's what's um, helping us um, not to pay tax, which which then obviously means that we don't have any franking credits to pay out, but they should start to exhaust in within a within in about a year's time. So give it a couple of seasons and we'll we'll start to phase in a uh, 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 a level of franking. Uh, it won't go to 100 percent straight away, but it will start to phase in in a couple of seasons. Okay, great. And then another one from me just to... Uh, on acquisitions, Russell, it, it, in terms of looking forward, it, is that going to restart again now? And if it was, you know, would it be looking at, you know, as you referenced, you know, um, trying to get staff with uh, technical digital skills these days is, 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 is very hard. So would it be, you know, buying capability or would it be, you know, buying a competitor that gets you into a, a new set of customers, like a new industry vertical. Uh, 
Well, Mark, I, I think it really depends on what we, we're doing in which market. So, so it could be both. Um, to, to be clear, uh, so in relation to acquisitions, I think first and foremost, it's about, you know, the company having a very clear strategy in terms of what it's doing in the market. So growth is, you know, is on our agenda in a, in a very, very material way. It's, it's, it's strategy number one is, is we want to grow this business and how do we grow? Um, but some parts of our business are, are undergoing very strong organic growth and, um, and, uh, and, 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 you know, we, we will support that strongly. Um, but I think strategically for us, you know, the Australian East Coast is a huge market opportunity in that we're still significantly underweight in. And whilst we've had phenomenal sales growth there, I think on the full year you'll see that. Um, it would make sense at some point in time to start to um, accelerate that growth where, uh, you know, in through acquisitions. And, and I think it, it depends, right? What, when you talk about acquisitions, each market has different characteristics that we'd be trying to, to uh, address. So I'll give you an example. In, in the Sydney market, you know, our Microsoft business applications business is flying and strong double digit growth, lots of resources, um, you know, however it is resource constrained, but, but lots of people, good capability, good customers, good front end engagement. You know, I, I wouldn't probably buy something in that market. I'd probably look to invest if I was going to buy something, I'd buy something in, in the data space, um, you know, which is absolutely flying for us in Western Australia, but in Sydney, you know, is, is not doing as well, still okay, but it's not doing as well. So I'd probably look to the data space there. But in Melbourne, you know, for example, our platforms business is performing really well. So I would go and buy there, I'd probably buy a Microsoft business applications business, and that would be both capability and market. So I could bring in there some strong capability at the front end of our business to help attack the market, some good customers. But the chance of success of that acquisition is very high, because the demand for those services in other markets for Empire today is so strong, that you know, if we were to see any weakness for whatever reason, we could actually keep all of those people busy on work outside a region. So you see what I mean? So I'm sort of buying it for the people because I can keep those people busy on deals in Sydney or Queensland. Um, but actually I'm also going to get the advantage of having talented people in markets going and, 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 and new customers too. So, so it kind of depends where we would buy. But, uh, but I do think, you know, looking at accelerating our strategy through acquisitions at the right point in time, and I'm not flagging that today is that, that time, makes some sense. I think the balance sheet is in really good shape. Um, I, you know, so, so I think that there's opportunities to do that if the right thing was there. Okay, great. Uh, so I think we'll leave it there because we have gone slightly uh, over time. So I'd like to thank you and David for coming on, uh, actually coming back again and for getting up early on your side over in Perth. And if you, I don't know if you've got a, another slide just on the contact details, Russell, if anybody wants to get in touch with you or with David. Well, it's it's got my name, <laughs> but, but no contact is there, a, is there a investors at empires.com.au or uh, what's the what would be the best way to reach out with anybody wants to there is an info at empire so you could send an, e an email to that address or or simply uh, i'd probably say channel your emails through david david.hinton at empire.com sorry about that david that's all right okay no, i just tried <laughs> to be, just trying to give people uh a way to get in touch if they want okay i'm going to leave it there because we have slightly run over time david russell thank you very much and everyone who dialed in uh thank you and have a good rest of your thursday mark thank you for the invite cheers thank, thanks for hosting us thanks mark bye-bye thanks david thanks russell